Okay, and welcome back to Complex Trauma in Children and Adolescents, Part 2. Now, remember that if you are taking this to receive live interactive CEU credit, you will have to participate in all of the poll questions as well as put in your name and email address. Your name and email will not be made public. Um, that will just go into our database so that we can make sure that you get credit for participating as well as get the email so you can take your quiz and get your certificate. That being said, we're going to go ahead and move on. As with last week, this presentation is based in part upon a white paper from the National Child Traumatic Stress Network entitled Complex Trauma in Children and Adolescents. It was published in 2003, but there's a lot of really good information that you can glean out of that. Okay, so for our first question, we're going to ask for your first and last name. This is again so we can make sure that you get credit for the responses that you enter and we can prove to your board that you are live, active, and participating. Um, I'm going to give you just a couple of minutes because when I go to the next screen to ask for your email, um, you won't be able to enter this question anymore. So. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move on. If I go too fast, just, you know, uh, submit a support ticket and we can make sure that you get everything else entered in this field. And no surprise, what is your email address? Again, we don't sell this list to anybody. This is just so we can email you when the class is finished so you can uh, purchase CEUs if you choose to and take the test and get your certificate. I'm going to go ahead and move on because there isn't another poll question for a little while. Uh, so you can take your time entering your email question. Um, email address, but let's get started with the class. Today we're going to continue discussing the impact of complex trauma on children and adolescents. We will identify the function of presenting symptoms and learn to apply practical tools to aid in teaching new skills and tools and helping the patient improve their quality of life. Complex trauma results from exposure to unpredictable, uncontrollable events that threaten the child's well-being. Now we talked about that a whole lot last week and this dates by, all the way back to birth and infancy when the child wasn't able to predict. They would have certain internal feeling states, hunger, fear, sleepiness, etc. And if those feeling states weren't responded to appropriately and if the child didn't learn to identify and deal with their own feeling states, the world became very unpredictable. Complex trauma, again, is traumatic events that usually that result in that particular area of their home environment, impacts seven basic areas, and we, we'll talk about those more as we go on today. Many children with complex trauma are diagnosed with a variety of mental health issues, each of which only partially captures the extent of the impact of the trauma. So if you have a child who's diagnosed with reactive attachment disorder, which is the one that comes to most everybody's mind right away when we're talking about complex trauma and trauma within the uh, family of origin, um, that only gives you a sliver of an idea about the impact of what's going on with that child. Attachment, which we talked about a lot last week, is one of those seven areas that is negatively impacted by complex trauma. So again, we're just going to review a little bit more. Attachment problem symptoms include uncertainty about the reliability and predictability of the world. For the infant who's crying because he or she is cold and they get provided a bottle, that's confusing. For the toddler who is crying because he or she is scared and gets food or gets sent to their room, it's confusing. They're relying on the adult, the caregiver, to meet their needs. And when the caregiver provides something that doesn't meet that need, the child's like, oh, well, maybe I was wrong. I don't, I don't understand. And the child doesn't learn how to regulate his or her own emotions. 
It's like, okay, I was scared and I got sent to my room. Now I'm still scared and I'm all alone. They have problems with boundaries. Some people who have um, reactive attachment disorder are overly enmeshed. Some are overly detached. Some go back and forth because they're not really sure how they're supposed to behave. It's a very chaotic environment that they're trying desperately to control. There's a lot of distrust and suspiciousness, not only of other people, but also of themselves. They're really very unattuned to what's going on inside them. They don't trust their own spidey senses. They don't trust their own reactions and interactions. So they socially isolate. The world out there is really scary, so what am I going to do? I'm going to stay at home. It's safer there. I don't have to deal with those really confusing things called other people. Interpersonal difficulties. Well, if you never learned how to read people, and you never learned how to trust people, and you don't even know what's going on inside yourself, it's going to make it difficult to communicate and develop meaningful, mutually beneficial relationships. Seems pretty self-explanatory. Difficulty attuning to others' emotional states. Well, if you never learn how to identify anger, sadness, fear, hunger, even though hunger is not an emotion, for yourself, how in the world are you going to identify it in other people? In most of these situations, um, children learn to develop ways of reading other people better than themselves, but not always. They usually expect the other person's emotions to change on a dime. There's no predictability. And difficulty in listing other people as allies. Well, if you can't understand their emotional states, you don't know how to communicate well, you have difficulty regulating your own emotions, it's going to be hard to say, hey, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to ask you for help. Yeah, not so much. My point is, as we look at these behaviors, as I've said over and over again, people's behaviors, whether they are infants or elderly or somewhere in between, it makes sense if you can get inside of their worldview and their frame of reference. Not necessarily the most healthy thing in the world, but if you can meet them where they are and help guide them out into a more functional way of thinking, interpreting, perceiving, then you're well on your way. So, thinking about the patients that you have, how do your patients display attachment problems? I mean, we have <clears throat> a variety of people. Okay, poor boundaries. It's sometimes I'll meet somebody, not me, but sometimes a person who has complex trauma will meet somebody and they will just like vomit out their entire history. They're so desperate to have someone to depend on. Um, they don't know how to regulate. They don't know what those boundaries are. Or growing up in an environment where it's don't talk, don't trust, don't feel, um, the, the child learns that my feelings have to equate with your feelings. Okay, you're in a bad mood, so I'm in a bad mood. And it has to be because of me. Overdependence. Being overly dependent on people to fix it for you. Because the world is so chaotic, some people just kind of sit down and go, I'm out. If you want it fixed, I need you to do it for me because I can't, I can't do anything right. Difficulty separating from others and telling non-truths. It's very difficult when you can't self-regulate and when you can't identify your own emotions to separate from somebody who you think is helping you do that. That's like separating ourselves in half. So if the person never internalized it, it's going to be really hard to separate because that other person tells you how you're feeling, how you're thinking, what you want, what you need. Um, let's see. And attachment problems can also be, be displayed as being overly trustful, over-dependent on people, or crying a lot and a lot of anxiety because of uh, fear of abandonment. So we have a whole realm of things. None of them look like good solid boundaries. It's either desperation 
um, because of fear of abandonment or isolation because of fear of being betrayed. So another one of those areas that's negatively impacted in complex trauma is cognition. That means the way people think. Difficulties in attention regulation. So people who come from an environment that's chaotic tend to be hypervigilant. They tend to be on guard all the time, always looking around. So they have difficulty regulating their attention and focusing on one thing because they're scanning constantly, constantly aware because they can't predict. They have difficulty understanding what A causes what B. Lack of sustained curiosity. If you're on all the time, um, the best example I can give you, I volunteered when my son was in preschool. Um, I volunteered in his classroom, which I love little kids. They're awesome. But being in a classroom with 12, 2, and 3-year-olds is exhausting because you are on all the time. You have to know where little Sally is, where little Johnny is, and what little Susie's doing behind your head. In some ways, that's how a person who is hypervigilant feels. They're on all the time, constantly scanning, constantly looking for dangers. And it's exhausting. So it's hard to be curious and exhausted at the same time. It's just like, heck with it. Difficulty processing new information. When we learn in school, we learn things, you know, developmentally. When you learn math. You start out by learning your numbers. Then you learn how to add numbers. Then you learn how to subtract numbers. You see where I'm going with this? It builds on itself. The same thing is true with just about everything in our world. We learn things and we build on them. So if that foundation knowledge about what's trustworthy, what to expect, what's dangerous, if that's not created correctly, people don't learn how to do that, then they have difficulty taking in new information and going, okay, this can go in the trustworthy pile, this goes in the skeptical pile. Not so much. It's also difficult to take new perspectives because everything's so chaotic, it's almost hard to believe that there is any sort of rhyme or reason to the world. When somebody tells you, oh, it doesn't have to be like that, or people are really, for the most part, good and trustworthy. A lot of people are going to look at you like, you've lost your mind. So difficulty processing new information because their prior experiences are chaotic, uh, disorganized, or organized in a protective defensive way that says, no, this person is being nice to me, so there must be an ulterior motive. Because every time somebody's been nice to me in the past, there's been an ulterior motive. And I don't know how to believe that there's possibly something else, some other reason somebody could want to be nice. Difficulty or deficits in object constancy. Being afraid that as soon as somebody walks out of your sight, they're gone forever. Now, with little kids, we get that. They don't understand. I mean, you can put a toy under a towel, and they're like, where'd it go? Um, then after about, you know, 18 months or so, they start figuring that out. But with children who grow up in a chaotic environment, they don't have that object constancy. Sometimes mom will be there in the morning, sometimes not. Sometimes dad will be there for a week or two, sometimes he'll be there for two years. You can't predict. There's no constancy in the environment, so there's no way to really organize your world. And it's difficult to, to predict because mom or dad or auntie or whoever the caregivers are may be there physically but not emotionally. They may just be completely checked out, which adds a whole nother dimension for a child who can't understand being there physically but not emotionally. They're like, well, you're there. Why don't you play with me? You must not like me. Remember, children think very concretely and very egocentrically. It's all about me. Um, problems with orientation to time and space. Proper physical boundaries, proper time boundaries. When you're hypervigilant, you're on guard all the time, you can lose track of time. Problems 
planning things out and sticking to a schedule because their life is chaotic. They're used to chaos and they function as well as they can within that chaos, but that's not necessarily on everybody else's schedule. So you need to look at the reasons why people are having difficulty planning their time and knowing how long it's going to take or how little time it's going to take. Time management can be huge. That's another skill we learn as children. Time management. You have to do these five things. How much time is it going to take you to get it done? And what barriers might you find that you're going to have to overcome? All right, next poll question. How do your patients display problems with cognition? Okay, hypervigilance, definitely. Being on guard all the time and constantly being aware means you're scanning, but it's hard to get in depth with anything. <clears throat> Difficulty focusing on a task, challenging to um, follow through. When you start something, you can be distracted because guess what? That's how life was when the child was growing up. Ooh, lots of things coming in. Um, difficulty staying alert because you're exhausted. At a certain point, you're just kind of walking around in a daze going, oh, I know I left that somewhere. Or I walked in here for a reason. Oh, wait, that was me this morning. Um, most of us have those periods where we get a little bit distracted. Imagine feeling like that 24-7. Um, difficulty accepting that some people may be trustworthy. It goes against this framework that I've created growing up with betrayal and abandonment and all this other stuff. Now you come and say, oh, hi, I'm here and I'm trustworthy. Not. Helping people integrate the past and the present is going to be crucial. Inability to tolerate separation from a loved one because you're not sure whether they're coming back or not. Well, what does that mean if they don't come back? Does that mean you die inside? Does that mean you go away inside? Or does that mean that they're gone? So this separation, this physical, emotional boundary, and helping somebody figure out who they are, um, not trusting, difficulty in completing anything they start, Difficulty understanding they're worthwhile. If you grew up your entire life waiting for somebody to validate that you were okay just for being you and nobody ever did, then those people are the ones who tend to be more dependent and look to significant others and bosses and anybody to tell them, you're good, I need you. Anything else? All right. Affect control issues. Children who grow up in an environment that's unpredictable have difficulty with emotional regulation. We talked about this some in the attachment section. When a child is upset, when an infant is upset, and you pick them up and you hold them, if you are upset, guess what? They get more upset. If you are calm, they tend to calm down faster because they can hear your heartbeat when you're holding them. Um, kangaroo care when, with preemies is huge because it helps the infant hear the mother's heartbeat and it helps with bonding. It also helps the infant learn how to self-soothe. Um, not that it stops there. As soon as the infant gets out of the NICU, you still have a lot of training to do on, or teaching to do on self-soothing and emotional regulation. A lot of children experience, I mean, I think every child, experiences things that overwhelm their little coping capacities. That's just life. Life throws stuff at you. In a healthy environment, the parent or caregiver is there to go, okay, let me take this part that you can't handle right now and let's work through it together because you shouldn't have to handle that on your own. In a dysfunctional family, mom may not be there or caregiver may not be there. So the little kid's like, huh, I don't know what to do with this. So what does the child do? 
anything it can to get somebody to help him out, which generally looks like acting out, hitting, biting, temper tantrums, throwing poop, you know, whatever it takes to get somebody's attention because they're feeling very scared. Uh, that people who experience complex trauma have difficulty identifying and communicating feelings and internal experiences. They feel icky. That doesn't help me. Tell me what icky looks like. Um, helping children put words to their internal feelings is something we do through those infancy through elementary school years. They learn to identify complex and sort of ambiguous concepts such as jealousy and envy and anger and happy, mad, glad, sad, all those words that you learned in Counseling 101. We're not born learning how to communicate that. Children who don't learn how to communicate that learn other words. Like, I feel stupid. OK. Now, I'm not going to look at a child and say, stupid's not a feeling. Try again. That was stupid to say. No. Uh, take it where the child is and say, OK, what does stupid mean to you? Tell me, tell me why you feel stupid. And then you may be able to translate that to embarrassed or ashamed or guilty, whatever happens to be more um, on task. Help them find different words. Find that little chart that has all the different little faces and emotions. One of the things I do with children is I have them take crayons and color the different emotions. So the one where the guy's mouth is a little squiggly um, and, and he's feeling very confused. A lot of times I see that one colored green and it's like, ooh, I don't feel so good. I'm kind of confused. Uh, depending on your person, they may identify better with colors or pictures or words or sounds. Uh, you need to attune to that person's learning style to figure out how to best start identifying those emotions. Ideally, we're going to get them to the place where we're all using the same verbiage, but you've got to start somewhere. They have difficulty communicating wishes and desires. Well. They don't know what they are. Their wishes and desires have always been whatever keeps that other person from running away, abandoning them, or freaking out. So stepping back and saying, well, that's, those are that person's wishes and desires. What are yours? What do you like to eat? What do you like to do? And a lot of times they'll go, I don't know. That's fine. Let's start there. What things? Um, might you enjoy doing? What things might you be willing to try? Um, do you like outside? Do you like inside? Do you hate breaking a sweat? Sometimes it can feel like you're playing 20 questions, but if you can identify a few things, or at least help the client start brainstorming things they like to do, um, then you'll get a better idea on what their wishes and desires are, and you can help them start identifying those. With children, you can have them draw a, picture of, draw a picture of your happiest day. What happened? What was going on? Who was there? You can talk about that. And as we we've talked about already today, problems maintaining emotional boundaries. Problems saying, I'm happy today. I'm sorry you're sad. And I feel bad for you, and I'll help you any way I can. But that doesn't mean I have to be sad. Emotional boundaries is tricky for a lot of people, not just people with complex trauma, but in people who grow up in addicted families or abusive families, it's not safe to have your own feelings because that gets you punished. So as adults or adolescents, they have difficulty identifying their feelings, safely communicating them, and maintaining those boundaries when someone that they have come to depend on, healthy or not, expresses a different emotion. And affect leads to behavioral most of the time. Poor modulation of impulses. I feel icky inside or I feel stupid 
generally when I work with a kid who's indicated that he or she is stupid or feels stupid, a lot of times they are acting out aggressively towards themselves or towards other people. They're either hitting themselves, hitting somebody else, hitting the wall. Um, <clears throat> this is the modulation of impulses. This is all those feelings inside that I can't control. And so they have to come out some way. And that's the child's ineffective way of keeping from spontaneously combusting. So we want to help them identify their feelings and modulate their impulses. You may have to do it backwards though, because they're not going to come to you or be presented to you oftentimes until they're at that breaking point. So what do you do? You say, okay, you're really angry right now. Let's go on a walk. Let's go outside and hit a tennis ball. Let's go shoot hoops. Let's find something active to help that child get rid of those impulses. Find, let them draw, let them color, let them, whatever it is that that child wants to do that will help them calm down enough where they can use their words. And then you can talk about the feelings and talk about what to do the next time. And yes, it sounds advanced, but even for an elementary school kid, there are, you can talk about, well, Okay, so that made you angry. So the next time that happens, what do you think you can do? Tell a teacher, walk away, um, whatever the situation calls for. Self-destructive behavior. If acting out doesn't help, then we start acting in. Cutting, hitting things, banging your head into the wall. What purpose does that serve? It distracts the person. It cries for help, because generally that behavior is going to elicit intervention. But it also distracts the person from whatever internal crisis is going on. They're focusing on the pain of the cutting, or the relief from not hearing those voices and all those thoughts go through their head, because they're focused on this right now. Remember we talked earlier about problems with sustained attention? Well, it's hard not to sustain your attention when you're self-injuring. Self um, that's one of the first things we need to look at is when you start to feel overwhelmed or out of control, what can you do that is not harmful? Holding an ice cube. Putting your hands in a bucket of ice water. Now, let me tell you, I've got carpal tunnel, and that'll focus your attention for a while. Um, <clears throat> that is not pleasant. However, it is not self-injurious. So if that's what the child or person needs to do in order to prevent harm, then let's start there. And we'll try to work on coping skills from that point. Aggression. What's the purpose of aggression? Fight or flee. Those are our stress reactions. It's a self-protective mechanism. So if somebody is acting aggressively, you have to say, what, what was the threat? The aggression generally was meant to dominate or protect. So what was the threat? And how could we deal with it differently, if at all? Was it really a threat? And that's that whole cognitive behavioral thing. And how you deal with aggression, obviously, is going to differ depending on whether you're working with a 5-year-old or a 15-year-old or a 55-year-old. And we'll talk a little later about the fact that a lot of people who experience complex trauma develop these ways of acting and reacting and interpreting the world that are pretty much the same unless you provide an intervention, unless they go to counseling or do a lot of self-exploration work on their own when they're 25, 35, 55. And that's what they learned. So one of the things we want to understand is just because someone is chronologically old enough that they should know better, what is their world experience and have they ever been shown any other way? Pathological self-soothing behaviors. And that, conclude, that can include self-injury, drinking, risky behaviors. 
Some people self-soothe by going out and doing something that is very adrenaline focused. They've got that adrenaline coursing through their veins because of whatever it was that started the chaos inside them. So they're going to put it to good use and they will drive recklessly, they will bungee jump, they will parachute, they will take perfectly good doors off of a helicopter. Um, sorry. Difficulty complying with rules. Let's think about that. From the perspective of someone who grew up in an environment that was unpredictable, chaotic, and a lot of times unsafe, if somebody starts putting rules and trying to control you, what's your first reaction? Uh-uh. Why should I trust you? Why should I comply with rules? I'm going to try to get some control back of my life and my existence. And reenactment of prior trauma in daily behaviors. We can learn a lot. This is obviously more true in small children, but we'll see it reenacted in relationships of adolescents and adults. <clears throat> This reenactment of prior trauma. They're doing it over again. Why? Well, some people believe that they do it over again to try to come out victorious. Some people believe that they do it over again because they don't know any different. Doesn't matter why they're doing it over again. We need to look at, well, I guess it does matter why, but we need to look at what the purpose is in this particular instance. You did X, Y, and Z. What was your motivation there? What was your thought process? Uh, people who have been victimized sometimes will take more risks uh, because they feel, well, lightning won't strike twice. Mm -hmm. Challenging irrational thoughts. Not all people do. Some people who've been victimized go the other direction and are much more cautious. Some people deal with it just fine. So I'm not making a sweeping statement about survivors of trauma. What I'm saying is you need to look at each individual on an individual basis and take each episode and go, okay, what does that mean? What was the motivation or the purpose of that chain of events? So, how do your patients display behavioral control issues? Impulsivity. No filter. I act, I react. I act, I react. I receive input, I react. Impulsivity is there when there's not a filter or a coping skill to go, okay, now let's look at the logic of this situation. It's much more primitive and usually comes up when people are kind of at their boiling point. So they need to push that stress away or push that pain away as quickly as possible to survive. Um, banging their head or banging their fist into their head. Now I don't mean I could have had a V8, but you get the idea. Um, <clears throat> Hostility, behavioral control issues keep coming out until we learn how to control our emotions and identify those emotional states. Self-injury, and this is adults and children. Again, just because we're chronically, chronologically older and theoretically have had access to better coping skills and more learning time, doesn't mean that we actually have. Screaming, lashing out at peers. It's not uncommon to be in a workplace where you have somebody who has a hair trigger and you know you say the wrong thing and they will read you the riot act until next Friday. Is that appropriate for an adult? No, not usually. Um, it's not usually even appropriate for adolescents. However, we need to look at what prompted that. And what prompted the reaction at that level? A lot of times, I say we're, we react to a 1 with a 10 because we've been stuffing stuff. And then after a while, and it may not be at that one person, it just may be stuff. Okay, fine, whatever, 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 whatever. Then somebody leaves the seat up on the toilet 
And whoever did that, look out because you're going to pay the price for everybody else's done me wrongs for the past six months. Damaging parents' possessions. Okay, so if you're angry at your parents, stealing from them, damaging their stuff, uh, temper tantrums, breaking toys. Children, more than adults, but even some adults, you know, I've seen a remote control fly across the room before in residential settings. It occasionally happens. So again, we need to say, hmm, what elicited that reaction to that degree from that person? There's always a reason. So again, if somebody's acting or reacting much more strongly than you think they should, huh, two things there that are wrong in that statement, you need to go back and ask yourself, well, why did they react that way? Running away, huge one. I've got to get out of here. I can't take this anymore. Can't take the chaos. I need some quiet. By the same token, we see grown-ups doing that too. They just, fine, heck with it, take off. Or they drown themselves and go on this journey um, in, in, to, into substance abuse where they're physically present, but emotionally and cognitively, not so much. So there are a lot of behavioral control issues that may or may not stem from complex trauma. Now, everything that we've talked about today, I do want to point out, can be symptomatic of a lot of other things. However, if when you're doing your psychosocial evaluation, you realize that this child grew up in an environment where there was substance abuse, domestic violence, or significant other trauma of some sort, you want to start being alert to these things and figuring out exactly what ways that environment is currently impacting your client. She didn't learn how to trust, okay? So when she perceives that she's been slighted, she freaks out. Makes sense when you look at it that way. So what do we do? We start back at the beginning and go, what does trust look like? So next question, or final question actually, in what ways do our adult patients still display these behaviors? And we've been talking about that quite a bit. Sometimes we'll be lucky enough to have adolescents or, or children come to our office so we can intervene early. That's not always the case. A lot of times we have adults who present and they're like, oh, let me tell you. Again, it doesn't have to be necessarily trauma, um, a, a single trauma. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. We look at things and talk about the experience of the threat of being killed or dying or significantly injured. Well, an infant who can't feed themselves, can't clothe themselves, and can't even crawl away from danger, if mom or dad or caregiver of some sort is not responding, that's kind of a life-threatening situation. Um, so as adults, they may still have some repercussions from that. Um, now, that's kind of a huge, huge step. But we need to look at ongoing patterns of behavior in addition to acute traumas. So let's go through some, uh, some common diagnoses that we see in people with complex trauma, <clears throat> as well as people without complex trauma. Again, I don't want you to say, make a connection that's one-to-one. -one. There are a lot of kids with ADHD who've had perfectly good childhoods, and they just have ADHD. So let's look at, they have problems with concentration. Well, yeah. Have difficulty sitting still. Well, if they're hypervigilant, they're not going to want to sit still. They're going to want to see what's going on in the whole room. Difficulty following through. Is this sounding familiar to an earlier slide? Yeah. And difficulty with impulse control. 
So, is it ADHD or is it effects of complex trauma? Do we want to differentiate the diagnosis? Let's look at what's motivating each individual behavior. Let's not get caught up as much in these, um, in these labels. Now we know that children with ADHD are going to respond differently to the ADHD meds than children without ADHD. So that's the other thing that we want to be aware of is, is just because somebody has these symptoms doesn't mean that giving them an ADHD med is going to make everything better. Um, far from it. Conduct disorder. Aggression to people and animals. Well, there's a lot of rage in there. Children, remember again, fight or flee. If a child gets angry a lot, they can't run away because they're three and they can't change their, or well, two and they can't change their own diaper. Um, so they need to stay. A lot of times they internalize anger, not only their own, which they haven't learned to identify, but also there's generally a lot of anger and ugh, stuff. You know, like those good emotional words there? <laughs> ugh, stuff. Um, negativity going on in their home environment. So aggression to people and animals, not that I like it, you know, it breaks my heart for both the people and the animals, but understanding what that means to that person. Why is it that doing this makes you feel better? What else could we do instead? Um, why is it that doing this gives you some relief? And those can be complex issues. Destruction of property. Well, again, that anger that's been internalized. Deceitfulness, lying, or stealing. Let's look at their home environment. What did they learn from those caregivers? Hmm, deceitfulness, lying, and stealing, maybe. Um, conduct disorder is a really stigmatizing diagnosis in a lot of cases. And when at one of the former places I worked, we had this sort of automated assessment thing. And every single adolescent that came through had marijuana dependence and conduct disorder. I'm like, how can 100% of the adolescents coming through here have marijuana dependence and conduct disorder? And in reality, these symptoms Yes, they are symptomatic of conduct disorder, but they're also symptoms that are present in a lot of other things. So we need to look at the bigger picture and make sure that we're addressing the proper issue. How do we do that? Again, looking at the motivation behind the behaviors. Serious violation of rules. Why would somebody do that? Um, maybe because when they've done what adults told them in the past, it didn't work out so good for them? Possibly. There are a lot of possibilities, but you need to explore it with your client. Help them come to an understanding because that empowers them to make better choices. Oppositional defiant disorder. Negative, angry, and resentful. Defiant, disobedient, hostile towards authority figures, temper tantrums, argumentative, blames others, acts touchy and is easily annoyed spiteful or vindictive and acts aggressively towards peers. That sounds like pretty much every adolescent I've ever met. It's a matter of degree. What do the behaviors mean? How constant are they? How severe are they? We all get negative, angry, and resentful at times. What do you do with it? And is what you're getting negative, angry, and resentful about worth your energy? Defiance and disobedience. OK, we've covered that one in pretty much every other diagnosis. The people they've trusted the before have, de ah, have betrayed them. So I'm going to do what I want now, thank you, because it couldn't turn out any worse. Makes sense. Starting back and saying, OK, let's work on this together, making sure the person 
has a voice in it, will engage them. Hostility toward authority figures. Well, if you grew up in that kind of environment that was unpredictable, unsafe, and scary all the time, and nobody helped you out, you'd probably be hostile towards authority figures too. Makes sense. So what do we have to do? We have to relearn. Let's identify some authority figures who haven't let you down currently. Now that you are fill in the blank with age, 15, 25, whatever, you don't have to rely on people to rescue you anymore because in the past they let you down. Acknowledge their past. Don't take it away and go, well, you know, I'm sorry, maybe they should have, blah, blah, blah. No, they let you down. There's no excuse for it. Has temper tantrums. Well, we all do sometimes. Figuring out how to channel that energy into ways that are healthy and constructive. Painting, cleaning, exercise, whatever it is that they need to do. Writing. Some people, when they get really upset, they just want to say everything and they don't say it nicely. So if they can write it down and get it out of their head, then they can get all the nasty stuff out with all the stuff they wanted to say, and then they can go back and edit. That's generally better for communication. Is argumentative with adults? Well, again, a lot of times adults have let them down, so maybe they're trying to get power back so they don't get disappointed again. Blames others for misbehavior. I see that a lot in my substance abuse clients. So why wouldn't you expect to see it in their children? They've learned to blame other people. It's not my fault I'm this way. Well, yes and no. You didn't choose your circumstances, but what you choose to do with it now is your responsibility. Acts touchy and easily annoyed. These are people who are highly reactive. Give them something to do to reduce that reactivity. If they're touchy and easily annoyed and people say something and they're just like, oh, have them count to 10, have them say the serenity prayer, have them whatever it is, they can give them about 30 seconds to keep their mouth closed until they can get out of that adrenaline fog and say something appropriate or not say something is spiteful or vindictive. As we get older, we realize being spiteful and vindictive really just is a waste of a lot of energy most of the time. But a child doesn't realize that, and they want to get back at people. What does getting back at people mean? It means I'm getting my power back. It comes down to power and feeling disempowered. So if we can empower, then the need for vengeance goes down some. And having difficulty maintaining friendships. Uh, yeah. Well, if you read through all the things before that, you'll see why the person has difficulty maintaining friendships. So we need to look at the totality of it. It's hard to make friendships, so I feel bad. And it's hard to keep friendships because I feel bad. So where do we start? Where is it that that person wants to start? Do they want to try to make a friendship? Do they want to try to feel better about themselves? Do they want to work on self-esteem? Do they have depression or anxiety issues? What is it that person wants to work on? And educating them about what healthy relationships look like. If they've never seen one, they're not going to know how to form one. Generalized anxiety disorder. Well, it is anxiety provoking to be in an unpredictable situation all the time. We're not going to go through each symptom because this is a pretty common diagnosis. <clears throat> I want you to look at how these behaviors make sense in someone who their entire life the world has been chaotic. They don't know how to identify those internal feelings. 
You know, when the rest of us go, oh, I am so stressed, I feel like I'm going to crawl out of my skin. They can't put words to it. They're just like, ah. So what you want to do is help them figure out how to put words to it. Because once they set, figure out, oh, I'm stressed, then they can say, hmm, what am I stressed about? But if they can't find a starting place, then they're just kind of spinning and treading water. Good health, nutrition, exercise, sleep, all those things form the foundation of Maslow's hierarchy and form the foundation for our patient's recovery regardless of their age. It's going to be really hard to do too much work with someone who's only sleeping one or two hours a night. So help work with them on how to release muscle tension, how to sleep better, how to eat more healthfully, and what things may help them sustain a more constant energy level and blood sugar level so their mood and their blood sugar is also not going up and down. Also helping them identify the reasons for physiological symptoms. Am I having heart palpitations because I'm stressed, because I've had too much caffeine, or because I'm having a heart attack? You know, there's, there's a pretty wide range there. Helping people identify their own physical reactions to stuff and de-escalate. Help them make a plan if they say, I don't know. I don't know if I'm having a heart attack or a panic attack. Okay, so how are you going to handle that? Let's make a plan right now. Because half of the battle, or more, is knowing that there might be a less drastic reason for your heart palpitations, but also having a plan so you know you're not going to die. Separation anxiety. We talked about problems with object permanence. Caregiver walks away, you don't know if they're coming back. On more than one occasion, I worked in, with families who the kid went to school and mom got arrested and, <laughs> you know, junior came home and there was nobody there um, except for the social services worker. <clears throat> so it makes sense in this person's reality. They don't learn to trust. They don't learn to self-regulate. So they start having these relationships when they're, you know, in their teenage years. And the relationships don't work out, and they constantly feel abandoned. Well, so then every time they get into a relationship where they feel like they're starting to establish something, they like freak out. They're like, you can't leave, because if you leave, you may never come back. Separation anxiety disorder, obviously not diagnosed as that in adulthood, but in children we see a lot of crying and temper tantrums and refusal to go to school um, and consistent. I mean, there's, I always tell the story about when I, my son went to preschool for the first time. First day I took him, I dropped him off and he held his teacher's hand, wonderful teacher, and he cried and I walked outside, you know, out of his view and I cried. Second day I took him back there walking him over to the door, I'm preparing for the waterworks, give him to his teacher, she's like, hi, takes his little hand, he's like, bye mommy. I walked outside and I cried. <laughs> Securely attached children, you know, the first time they do something may be a little scary and they may cry, but once they get into it and they realize that their caregiver is not going to put them in harm's way, they're fine with it. Insecurely attached children will be restless, agitated, crying, inconsolable the entire time. All right, so we're going to pick up the pace a little bit. Reactive attachment disorder, failure to follow others in the room with their eyes. These are children who have difficulty engaging with other people. They just, they don't even know how to, to connect because they were never connected with. Um, failure to reach out when picked up. The little child that just sits there and looks at you like, yeah, whatever, pick me up, leave me here, I don't care. Breaks your heart. 
Uh, no interest in playing interactive games. People are just too much stimulus. The world is too chaotic. Engaging in a lot of self-soothing behavior. They're calm when they're left alone. They don't have that input from all those other people. Watching others closely, hypervigilance, but not engaging. It's safer to stay back here. <clears throat> and masking feelings of anger or distress. Because you know what? That's not safe. In most of these households, when children express anger or distress, they get punished or sent to their room and just ignored. So they've learned that that doesn't do any good. Or worst case scenario, it's harmful. So they don't express any of those feelings. With these children starting out by just meeting them on their own terms, playing with them a little bit if they need to be left alone, leaving them alone, giving the, them the option to engage. And it's going to depend on every child. You also want to have children evaluated for any of the autism spectrum disorders. Um, if you have a, a suspicion, then that may, may be occurring as well. Um, autism spectrum disorders, uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, uh, are part of the autism spectrum, can result from a mother who drank while she was pregnant. So if you suspect fetal alcohol spectrum issues, it's really important to have the child assessed as early as possible. That way interventions can be provided. Enough on my little soapbox. So in summary, we need to evaluate behaviors in terms of their function over the course of the child's development. Person's 25 years old and still throwing temper tantrums. What's that about? Well, let's look and let's see how that has served them and been rewarded or reinforced throughout their life span. <clears throat> Children may display symptoms of multiple diagnoses as a result of delayed or problematic development in one or more areas. If you're spending all your energy just trying to predict the world, you, you don't have energy to do a lot of other stuff. Most parents will tell you that when their child was getting ready to go through a growth spurt or developmentally doing something different, other things would slack off. My children would be great with one thing, and let's say math. They'd be excelling. And then all of a sudden, it's like they couldn't add two and two anymore. And I'd, what's going on? Well, their verbal skills were kicking in. And then everything would balance out again. And then they'd jot ahead in one, kind of fall behind a little bit in the other one, and jot ahead again. Now we're talking over the course of a couple weeks, not months. Um, when your child starts to get sick, or at least mine and, and several of my friends, um, a lot of times they'll seem disorganized or forgetful, more so than usual. Their body's using all that energy to try to fight off, as we call them in our house, the bugga buggas. Not to focus on where did I leave my iPhone. And we want to aid the child in examining interpretations and beliefs in terms of present skills and conditions. Yes, when you were five, you had no other choice. You didn't have the words to use. You didn't have this, that, and the other. You are 15 now. What can you do differently because you're bigger and stronger and have more power? And you know more. Help the child understand that this was functional. It helped you survive until now. But it's not working for you anymore. So what could we do differently? All righty. Thank you for attending today. And I hope to see you next week at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 1 p.m. Central. Thank you. Bye-bye.